submissions um, from especially my international colleagues who are here today. Um, we also have an annual national meeting and many courses and symposia um, in both national and international meetings. Um, one of the strengths of the ECLA is we do have a lot of relations with different international organizations um, and we also welcome international members. So I have the information up here. Um, if any of you are interested in, in that, we're, we'd love to have you be a member, join a committee, um, or just learn more about us. So that's the, the information there. Now I'm going to start with our symposium. I think we have a really great mix of speakers today talking about contact lenses or sort of the pros and cons of um, contact lenses from a medical perspective, as well as a myopia control perspective, um, really focusing on both the good and the bad of contact lenses and some innovations. So I'm pleased to announce our first speaker, and he has actually graciously agreed to be with us here in our India meeting. He also had a prior uh, meeting scheduled with an Italian, um, Italian ophthalmology meeting. So he is actually gonna be globe trotting this morning or this, this evening for, for you in India. So uh, please ask questions for him after his um, talk. And then the rest of us will answer questions in a group session afterwards, um, just so we can make it to his Italian meeting as well. Um, it's especially a great honor for me to introduce him because um, Dr. Chilino is actually um, one of my mentors as a fellow. And I remember even then he was very interested in contact lenses and really thinking about contact lenses, not just as vision correction, but really using contact lenses as a medical device. So this is about 10 years ago. So he's really, you know, one of the pioneers in this area. And since then he's done a lot of work with this. Um, so he did his training at Mass Sinear and that's where he still is. Um, he's both a clinician and a researcher through the Mass Sinear and the um, Scafins Eye Research Institute. Also done work through um, funding with the National Eye um, Institute, the Department of Defense, and multiple other organizations. He's really been um, a leader in the contact lens tri um, clinical trials and also um, cross-linking um, trials as well. So he's currently doing, um, it, his special interest is in contact lens design and um, drug eluding contact lens. He's gonna give us a talk on that and I will stop sharing my screen so he can give his talk. Thank you so much, Christina. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen now. It's a real pleasure to, uh, to join you guys. I am seeing blank, give me just a second. Let me try this again. Um, sorry. Try this differently. There we go. All right, so I was saying I've always wanted to uh, travel to India. Uh, this isn't how I imagined it going, but I'll take this as step one. <laughs> All right, can you see my talk? Yes, sir. Well, thank you. Right. Fantastic, so as Christina said, I'm gonna be speaking about contact lens drug delivery. Um, these are my financial disclosures. Um, I'm an inventor on the contact lens technology and also um, I am a founder and a consultant for a company that was founded um, to commercialize the technology. And this is the disclosure that was developed by partners so I could share it to everyone. All right, so let's take a step back. Most of the medications we give are in the form of drops. Only about one to 5% of the medication in a drop goes into the eye though. So not very efficient. Um, that said, of the medication that gets into the eye, 90% of it goes through the cornea, okay? So the cornea is really important. It's a conduit for drug delivery into the eye. What's ironic here is that the cornea only accounts for 5% of the ocular surface. So even though the cornea is 5% of the ocular surface, 90% of the drugs are going through it from any drop that's placed in the eye. So, you know, we have as many forms of drug delivery that has been proposed, but if the cornea is so important for drug delivery, why not target the cornea? Well, that's what we've done. So in a sense, the cornea has a home field advantage when it comes to drug delivery. And a contact lens, since it sits on the cornea, would be more or less a, uh, a way to facilitate that. There's some advantages with the contact lens, but the concept isn't new and there's many challenges. One of the challenges getting enough drug into the lens. So you're dealing with a finite amount of space. You don't have a lot of area to work with. Think about Manhattan. So you don't have a lot of space, so they build up. 
Here we can't really do that. We have to, we're confined to the dimensions of a contact lens. Next, you need to have a mechanism for controlling the release. Uh, most contact lenses, if you were to soak them in a solution and place them on the eye, the drug will come out very quickly, half hours. So what we've done is we've enabled a system that allows us to load a lot of drug and yet release in a controlled manner. What we have is a very thin drug polymer film situated in the periphery of the contact lens. Uh, the contact lenses are similar dimensions to commercially available uh, bandage contact lenses. They can be made with or without vision correction and they're made completely with FDA approved materials. So I'm gonna focus on ocular inflammation. This is a dexamethasone eluding contact lens. And this is the drug flux in rabbits compared to drops. Not just any drops, but drops that were placed every hour for eight hours. And these were the drug levels we got in the cornea. Um, in comparison, we placed a contact lens on the eye. And at various time points over a week, we euthanized the animals and looked at the drug levels. Now, mind you, this is a log scale. And so you can see that we're getting much more drug into the eye. And not only can we get the drug into the eye, but it's staying there for a long period of time. And this is just with one contact lens. We get to the cornea, and even the retina, we're getting significant levels into the eye there. So what about efficacy? We, we know the drug's getting there, but does it work? We've done four different models of, uh, of uh, efficacy studies. One is on corneal, corneal neovascularization, another was on corneal haze, another one is on uveitis, and also retinal vascular leakage. For today's talk, since we are mostly focused on the front of the eye, I'm gonna focus on the corneal vessel experiments. So for this study, what we did is we placed sutures along the cornea on the inferior and superior aspect of the cornea in a figure eight fashion. We took images at the time, and then we initiated treatment. We re repeated the imaging on day five, and then on day seven, the animals were euthanized. We then removed the cornea with a button and divided it in half. Half of it we used for PCR, half of it we used, um, and that, that was to look at the VEGF levels, and the other half we used to look at the CD45 cell frequency, so inflammatory marker. And so here's some images here. Uh, with the dexamethasone looting lens, you can see that there's almost no neovascularization present. Um, same with drops. Drops is very effective at preventing the neovascularization. However, with no treatment or with the vehicle lens, you have these vessels that have gone over and started creeping from the limbus. In fact, you can't see the upper half of the figure eight of the suture on either of those. So from a picture alone, this was very effective at preventing the neovascularization. And we measured the area. Uh, this was at day five in white, day seven in black. And we can see that we had significantly less, um, there's a p-value up here, but significantly less neovascularization compared to no treatment and the vehicle. What about infl inflammatory markers? Here, the CD45 cell frequency, we had very similar to the drops and significantly less than the untreated or vehicle. And the levels that we measured were very similar to the contralateral eye, which did not have any sutures. What about the VEGF levels? We looked at it two different ways, um, the VEGF KDR and the VEGF A, and we found that we had significantly, well, significantly less um, VEGF KDR than the vehicle or the untreated. Um, we weren't significantly less than the, than the dex drops, but nevertheless, we were quite, a, we were, um, it was a fairly small study, so I'm not sure if we can differentiate effect um, with such a small study, but the VEGF A actually did drops had lower levels than our lens. So it's biology, you never know what you're gonna get. And one of the surprising things we found was that we looked at the cornea thickness. I figured that folks like Debbie Jacobs would ask me about um, the cornea thickness and how this affects things. Um, and so we looked at that and here we measured it with OCT and we can see the no treatment uh, on day zero, day seven, the dexamethasone drops, our dexamethasone lens, and the vehicle. And just from this figure alone, I'm gonna go back here for a second, 
uh, from figure alone, you can see that the vehicle was significantly cre uh, greater, uh, result in a greater thickness in the cornea. And when you look at the measurements, we see the same thing. And this was the change in cell and uh, central cornea thickness at day seven compared to baseline. And what's interesting is the dexamethasone balloon lens had significantly less thickness than the vehicle. Not only that, significantly less than even no treatment. Um, and the drops helped a little bit too, but not as much as the dexamethasone lens. We did a four week biocompatibility study. We did this in order to study the effects of the lens so that we can use it in humans. And what we found is that once again, the effects didn't wear off necessarily. This was a lens repeated every week for four weeks. And our, our box plot here overlaps zero. So there wasn't a significant change in the cornea thickness compared to the, a commercial contact lens, which had significantly increased corneal thickness. So it seemed as though no one knows exactly why, but it seemed as though the dexamethasone in the lens prevented corneal edema. So I'd like to summarize where we are so far. Um, I've only showed you one of the efficacy studies. Our other studies have been published and I can certainly send you the link if you'd like. What we've shown is for dexamethasone eluding lens, we have controlled release. We have drug flux that was superior to hourly drops, a lot more drug out in the cornea than the hourly drops. We've shown efficacy in four different animal models and we have corneal edema that resulted from the control, uh, the vehicle that is, but it really didn't show that we had increased corneal thickness. It was unchanged. The um, human studies are actually this year. We have uh, consented our first patient and we should be having some data in the next month. And our indication we're looking at, um, you you're, might, might find this hard to believe, but working with my retina colleagues and we're looking at cystoid macroedema. And so we should have some data this spring on the effect of that. So, um, other things we're looking at that I'm really excited about. I didn't go into it here because we haven't published our data yet, but we have a moxifloxacin eluding lens that we were able to show was effective at treating MRSA keratitis that was resistant to moxifloxacin. So here we're able to use a drug more effectively instead of having to rely on other drugs of last resort like vancomycin. So let me uh, pause there and uh, you can see there are all the different contributors I'd like to thank. And this would be a good time to, ask, to answer some questions if there are any. Does anybody have any questions? I think you can either put them in, you can put them in the chat. I don't see any right now. Um, if not, I have um, a question. Um, were you able to check, I know it was a model, but um, if, if the pressure increased at all with the dexamethasone contact lens? Yeah, so we did look at that. There was absolutely no increase with the drops or the lens. Rabbits are not a great model though for studying um, uh, steroid response in, uh, with uh, ocular hypertension. I mean, quite frankly, either are humans. Uh, just a four-week study, you're, you're not going to see it there either. But the rabbits are particularly a poor model for, for studying that um, side effect of steroids. And would you be able to combine, I know you're looking at antibiotics and glaucoma medications as well, would you be able to com combine two drops or is it kind of one drop per, per contact lens? Yeah, that's a great question. We have, um, we have made prototype lenses for that have combined moxifloxacin and dexamethasone. Um, I'm applying for funding now and see if we can uh, go forward with those studies. But, uh, but that's kind of one of the next steps we're looking at. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, I'm very excited about that. Uh, you can imagine a situation where, you know, you, you would maybe after surgery or an infection or something like that, you put the lens on the eye and you don't have to worry about seeing them the next day. You don't have to worry about them being compliant. Um, they come back in several days or a week and you check on them, maybe switch it out with a new one. Yeah, I'm sure, the, I'm sure the patients would love that. So that anything that can reduce their post-op drops, I'm sure they'd be happy with. Yeah, and, and we also have developed a, uh, um, a couple of different lenses for Camptamoeba keratitis. So that's another one I'm excited about. That's wonderful. Does anyone else, um, I don't see any in the chat. So, and I know Dr. Cialino has to go to, go to Italy now. So um, if there's any other question, if you could either raise your hand or put that in the chat. If not, um, I think we'll go I on. I can ask next. a question. Oh, sorry. Sorry, Christina. Uh, Dr. Chilino, that was an excellent presentation. How do you 
how do you control the release? You know, most of the contact lens, the drug eluting contact lenses, one of the major issues is that as soon as you put them on the surface of the eye, about 50 to 70% of the drug, it comes out in the first two to three hours or even earlier than that. So how do you, how do you control that? Yeah, I'm gonna, I'm just gonna go back um, on the slides. Um, let's see. It, well, let me just tell you. Um, so basically we have a very thin drug polymer film. It's made of uh, PLGA and drug. And so it's that thin poly polymer film that's situated in the periphery of the contact lens that helps us to load the drug yeah. and control the release. Okay, but, but we, do you know what, how much drug is released in the first few hours, you know, so the, what I mean to ask is the graph might go up suddenly in the first half an hour. Um, and then sort of the amount of drug eluded from the contact lens might not be as much in this, in let's say you compare zero to three, three hours and then three to 12 hours. So that yeah. amount might be quite different. Yes, so um, we do um, intensive benchtop work first. And so what we do is, I think it's important to say how we do this because there are methods that have been done where they will place a lens in a solution and not necessarily change the solution, not necessarily have rotation, not necessarily have heat, all the things that you try to reproduce in the eye. Um, and we try to show that we have, um, we try that we should have in, what's called infinite sink kinetics, meaning that if you were to pl place this lens in Lake Michigan, it's gonna release the drug at the same amount as it would in a small container. And mm -hmm. so um, we, we change the um, lens quite frequently or change the uh, solution quite frequently. And in our studies, we have an early burst with dexamethasone and then it's fairly steady over the course of that week. At, at, as you can see here in the cornea, um, you know, in order, or the, even aqueous humor. So we, we, the, the release is a little bit less over time, but nevertheless, there's still release. And the aqueous humor is gonna turn over every 90 minutes. So in order yeah. to maintain levels far above drops, we have to have some sort of source, right? And so it's, it continues to, to release. Now, some other um, drugs have different release patterns. So for instance, latanoprost has a really high burst initially, but then, very steady release afterward. Um, I, I've heard Bob Langer give an example of how PLGA works uh, and, and why you get that burst. And, and he gave an example of actually a train in India. He said, you know, if you see a, a train in India that's really crowded, one of those pictures you see that's kind of a hyperbole of, 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 uh, of train travel. And you see people are like on top of the train and kind of like hanging out the sides. And when it comes to the station, everyone kind of gets off at once but then the people inside, it takes them a little bit longer to get out, right? And so it's the same idea with PLGA. You have some drug that's gonna be on the surface that's gonna come out initially. And that's what okay. you see from the first. But the drug yeah. that's inside of the drug polymer film takes longer to come out. Um, and you can modulate that depending on how much drug to polymer you uh, incorporate in that film. All right, thanks so much, thank you. Um, Christina, do you want me to introduce the next speaker? Okay, all right. So our next speaker is Dr. Dependent Daliwal. And I'm especially excited because we work together. Uh, so she's a professor of ophthalmology at the University of Pittsburgh School of Medicine. She's the director of refractive surgery. She's the director of cornea services at the UPMCI Center. Um, she's also the associate medical director of the Campbell Ophthalmic Microbiology Lab and has recently been appointed as the director of corneal stem cell task force at the University of Pittsburgh. She also serves as the Vice Chair of Communication and Wellness in the Department of Ophthalmology. It gives me great pleasure to introduce Dr. Daliwal and her, she's gonna to talk to us about a very, very important topic, almost a pandemic, contact lens related keratitis. Dr. Daliwal, please. Thank you so much, Dr. Tanji. And really thank you to Dr. Namrata Sharma for allowing us to uh, be involved in this amazing meeting. So the uh, International Ophthalmic Conclave is a three-day meeting with multiple rooms, and we, as the Eye and Contact Lens Association, are thrilled to be a part of it. So I'm going to bring up my screen, and 
Can everyone see my screen at this point? Okay, so let's get started. I'd like to share with you a basically a very simple protocol that we use for successful outcomes. I've been at the University of Pittsburgh for quite some time, and uh, we were lucky enough to recruit Dr. Vishal Janji to join us in our efforts. And it's, it's been a, quite a fun ride. So we're gonna share some, some information uh, as, as we see all these patients with infectious keratitis. So here are my financial disclosures, nothing is relevant. When faced with a patient like this, you know, your heart kind of sinks because you know that there's a long course that's going to ensue. This patient has an obvious corneal ulcer, but if you look carefully, there's actually uh, also a LASIK flap in this cornea. And this patient had had LASIK elsewhere, was waiting to have an enhancement, was simply wearing a contact lens for maybe about a minus one correction and developed this severe keratitis. So at this point, time is of the essence. And I'd like to share with you just some thoughts on how to manage these patients effectively. First of all, you have to think about why does contact lens keratitis happen? Well, the chronic hypoxia leads to decreased corneal sensitivity. There's also decreased, uh, a thinner corneal epithelium in contact lens wearer which leads to less um, a barrier to bacterial penetration. There's also reduced shedding of the corneal epithelial cells. So they have increased binding of these bacteria to the cell surface. The reduced barrier function of the corneal epithelium can be seen after just two weeks of soft contact lens use. So it's rapid change in the, in the cornea. And we know that in Soft daily contact lens wearers, the incidence is about one in 2,500 contact lens wearers per year. But when they wear contact lenses overnight, that rate increases dramatically to one in 500. There's been no difference with newer contact lens materials or the introduction of daily disposable contact lenses. And the organisms that we see most commonly um, in, in the US is Pseudomonas for sure in terms of contact lens wear. Uh, there's also Staphylococcus species, Strep species, and I'm going to speak about Acanthamoeba as well um, because that has been quite an issue and it, it's such a challenging organism to treat. And we did see some outbreaks with Fusarium as well. So the risk factors by and large, overnight wear and poor hygiene. There's also issues with tap water exposure, contamina contamination of the contact lens storage case, travel, swimming, overuse, misuse. And again, there were some outbreaks due to contact lens solutions that we had seen. So this first step when you face a patient who has a contact lens related uh, keratitis is to ask a good history. And so we start with what type of contact lens do you wear? And don't forget to ask if these are colored or cosmetic contacts because that can make a difference. I ask how many nights do you sleep in your contacts? Do you notice I don't say, do you sleep at, do you wear them overnight? I just assume that everyone does because most people do. Um, and they don't like to admit it because they know it's, it's sometimes problematic. So then we ask how you clean your contact lenses, which solution they use, do you top off the solution? And, <clears throat> and again, we ask how often do you use tap water to rinse the lens? And how they clean the case and do you shower in contact lenses? So we know tap water and contact lenses should never mix. So it's really important to <clears throat> ferret out if they are using contact lenses and not to be threatening when you're asking because patients want to tell you what you want to hear. So try to get to the truth and not be too threatening. So the oh, second, the yeah. second issue okay, is up. to, oh, I don't look want down. audio on this video. Hold on one second. Look Basically left. the left. important thing is Perfect. to yeah. do a careful assessment yeah. and really look all over the eye 
because some people have retained contact lenses and make sure you, uh, you know, I always like to do a very complete external eye exam because even in acanth amoeba keratitis, they can be associated with scleritis. So you really want to get an idea of the entire lay of the land and whether floppy eyelid syndrome, et cetera, could be contributing or whether someone has, you know, giant fornix syndrome, for example. So another critical thing is when you face an eye that's covered with mucus and purulent material, you have to remove all that mucus and debris to really understand the depth of infection and to see how thin that cornea is. And then you decide about the need for culture. We find that there's really no need to culture small or peripheral corneal ulcers, but we do recommend cultures if they're large or extending to the mid or deep stroma. If they're central or vision threatening, we always culture. And if it's a post-surgical uh, patient, for example, a refractive surgery patient, uh, we always culture. Now, if that the picture I showed you of a LASIK infection had been where the, the infiltrate was more under the flap, then that patient would have, you'd have to lift the flap and get material from under the flap um, in, in, in that case to really get a good sample. And remember to culture if there's poor response to the initial treatment. So we do the routine smears and cultures. Again, very important to think about all different types of organisms, including uh, fungi, acanthamoeba, et cetera. And just a few tips on culturing. We like to take the material from the leading edge of the infiltrate because that's where the highest yield of organisms is. Don't be shy, get an adequate specimen. In fact, if you debulk the organism and debulk the infiltrate while you're uh, removing the, the uh, material, it's actually a good idea. Uh, don't use cover slips on slide. And, and again, debris as much as possible. And we found that culturing the contact lens, contact lens case and contact lens solution can be very helpful in select cases. And then, there's the education speech, the doom and gloom speech that we give our patient. We talk about the risk of vision loss, perforation, the need for corneal transplantation, and the importance of compliance cannot be stressed enough. Until we have Joe Cellino's uh, drug eluding contact lenses, we depend on drops. And so what we do is we actually give a patient, if we're not sure about whether they'd be able to do this, we give them a drop test and we actually you know, have them apply a, a drop of, of um, you know, anything, even artificial tears into their eye just to see how they can handle it. And if they can't, then we think about admission to the hospital. So for smaller ulcers, and again, this is in the treatment step, we really uh, rely on fluoroquinolone monotherapy. But when you do that, dosing and compliance are critical. And we like to use fourth generation fluoroquinolones and we do a loading dose. Um, so these are concentration dependent killers. We want to get a ton of, of that uh, antimicrobial into the cornea as soon as possible. So we do every five minutes for four doses, every 15 minutes for four doses, and then every 30 minutes until 11 p.m. that night. And then we have them use it hourly around the clock. For larger or deeper ulcers, we, we employ uh, the fortified antibiotics. So tobramycin plus cefazolin or vancomycin. And after the loading dose, we have patients um, use the drops hourly around the clock. And they just wait five minutes in between the drops. We don't think that waking a patient up every 30 minutes to do alternate dosing is necessary. And we also tell them you can keep the cooler near the bedside so you don't have to go to the fridge every, every hour. So then we have to think about which is the correct antibiotic. And if you're unclear, just remember this website, imicrobiology.upmc.com. If you remember nothing else from this lecture, please just take that pearl away. Um, and everything that you need to know is in that website. This is our Campbell Lab uh, website. And uh, we're, we're really uh, happy to share the information that we have. We even have a link there to a course that we did um, at the Academy and it basically has our cliff notes and you can find information about lab testing, antibiotic susceptibility, antimicrobial therapy, our current research, and also photos um, that you're welcome to use in your talks. So for example, 
you can look at antibiotic susceptibility of keratitis uh, specimen from our lab. And if you had a strep pneumo uh, infection, you could actually look at the susceptibility of the bacterial isolates from keratitis um, specimen that from our lab to common antibiotics. And so this is updated. This was last updated January 1, 2019. So you could see that, you know, uh, a good choice uh, would be bacitracin, vancomycin, uh, e the, the quinolones work wonderfully, but of course we would stay away from gentamicin in this case. And then step four is to assess treatment efficacy. And the first thing I do when I walk in a room of a patient who has contact lens keratitis is I just say, do you feel better, the same, or worse? That answer to the question will basically determine whether I'm on the right path or not. If they feel um, better, and even if they don't look better, then I am going to stay with my therapy because often patients start feeling better before the clinical exam improves, especially in pseudomonas ulcers. If there's no improvement in 48 hours, you really need to modify therapy. So check the micro lab and remember to use the most potent cytal agent. We switch to cover MRSA and healthcare workers, then start thinking of atypical organisms uh, if you're not getting improvement in 48 hours. And we would switch to fortified antibiotics if the patient was on fluoroquinolone monotherapy. We would also consider a confocal microscopy or corneal biopsy. And remember that not all agents have equal corneal penetration and biofilm can be an issue. So intrastromal injections of antimicrobials can be very helpful. So let's just talk about a few cases. Um, and you know, this is a patient who came in and uh, she's a 65 year old woman who wore rigid contact lenses. And she was treated with this infection with antibiotics, steroids, antivirals for three months with no relief. So I said the question that I always ask, do you use tap water to clean your contact lenses? And she said, yes, of course. I followed the instructions on the bottle. I said, I don't believe you. There's no, no contact lens solution which would ever talk about tap water. I said, bring your bottle in the next time you come. So here is her contact lens solution bottle. I flipped it over and was horrified to see that it indeed said, rinse off thoroughly with fresh tap water. So this is obviously a problem. And uh, it was time for some more investigation. So we actually conducted a survey of contact lens solutions. And we published this in the Eye and Contact Lens Journal. And it turns out that although none of the soft contact lens products recommend tap water, 84% of products related to rigid contact lenses recommended the use of tap water um, to either rinse surfactant off the contacts or the storage case. So again, problematic. So it was time for some advocacy. And this is where, you know, I was so happy to be a member of the Iron Contact Lens Association. We advocated for change and we were successful. So, um, you know, the, the company that made the product, Bausch & Lomb, to their credit, uh, talked to the FDA and submitted, and now they're going to change the labeling of the contact lens solution. In terms of treatment of acanthamoeba keratitis, we know that it's, it's challenging. You want to debride as much as you can, debulk. Uh, there's combination therapy with a baguanide and a diamidine. And if it's not responding well, voriconazole can be helpful. So our patient after th six months of therapy looks a bit better. She did go on to corneal transplantation. Here's another case I'd like to share, a 23 year old with a red painful eye. And here's her exam as she came in on, upon presentation. Now you might first think oh, that looks like a dendrite, it's herpes simplex keratitis. But remember, HSV has the terminal bulbs and it has a very characteristic appearance. This patient, our patient, had early acanthamoeba keratitis. So it, we like to teach that a dendrite plus contact lens wear equals acanthamoeba keratitis until proven otherwise. So any patient with epitheliopathy or, you know, dendritiform changes in the, in these, in the uh, corneal epithelium, what we recommend is removing all of that in, involved epithelium and sending it to the microbiology lab. You're both 
doing something that is diagnostic and can be curative. Remember that amoebas start infecting the outer cornea and then spread deeper. And a ring infiltrate is a very late finding. So you can see that there's early acanth amoeba in the top slide, mid stromal acanth amoeba in the middle, and then late with that very deep involvement on the bottom slide. And if we see ring infiltrates in acanth amoeba, we really missed the boat. It means that we missed the diagnosis or the patient did not come early enough for treatment. So we really need to not wait for this sign to diagnose acanth amoeba. And also remember that some acanth amoeba keratitis patients do not have pain. Uh, unfortunately, they're treated for HSV keratitis for months at times and, and given steroids, which definitely makes things worse. Um, here's a, a really nice article from the BGAO that talks about, you know, what are the, the risk factors for bad outcomes with acanth amoeba keratitis? And the, the, the bad outcomes were associated with delayed diagnosis, corticosteroid use, a ring infiltrate, or older age. So again, please don't wait for that ring infiltrate. And we know it's difficult to eradicate because of the two forms, that active trophozoite and then the dormant cyst. Culture is important, but now we do PCR for acanth amoeba. And back to our patient, we did confirm the diagnosis of acanth amoeba. The patient was treated with a PHMB for four weeks only. And after um, some toxicity, the patient healed, vision recovered to 2020, and the patient is actually wearing glasses full time now, is not interested in contact lenses. Let's just talk about one more case to wrap things up. So this patient is a 22-year-old female, um, and she came to our clinic with four days of worsening left eye pain and blurry vision. She actually had just delivered a baby and uh, went into labor, fell asleep with the contact lenses, and then woke up with left eye pain. And, you know, she had a habit of sleeping in her contact lenses for about a week at a time. So she started Visine and Moxifloxacin, but was not improving. So again, here's my history. What type of contact lens do you wear? She's responded, colored. Who prescribed them? Nobody. Where did you get them? Convenience store. Do you have glasses? No, I don't need them. Okay, so I was horrified that this patient, who's a new mother, developed a contact lens-related ulcer from an illegally purchased colored contact lens that she got in the convenience store. So this is another uh, kind of epidemic that we're facing because cosmetic contact lenses are so common now. 88% of women expressed interest in changing the appearance of their eyes with colored lenses. And they're very common in Asian countries. Majority are young female emetropes. And the incidence of infection is, is challenging to, to estimate because there's non-traditional supply routes. But one study showed a 16.5 fold increased risk of infection for cosmetic contact lens wearers compared to regular refractive contact lens wearers. And another study showed that cosmetic contact lens wearers made up 12% of corneal infections presenting to 12 hospitals in France. And you know the risks are because the, the actual contact lens is, could be a problem. They're not made very well. Uh, the range of methods to achieve color is wide and it include, can include chlorine, titanium, iron, unspecified pigments. And when we, you know, there was a study that looked at uh, the permanency of the pigment and only two of 15 brands actually demonstrated permanency of that colored pigment when the contacts were gently rubbed with a moistened contact, uh, cotton swab. Uh, so the, the, the surface of these contacts are definitely rougher. And in, in addition to poor vision, there's definitely increased infection with higher levels of bacterial and acanth amoeba adherence. But here's the scariest thing that I read. Pathogenic organisms have been isolated in unused counterfeit contact lenses and contact lens solutions. And we actually examined this in our lab as well and did find um, organisms, bacterial organisms in some of the contact lens cases. So this is again, the start of another epidemic. Uh, when there, another study looked at inc incorrect con cosmetic contact, contact lens usage among teens 14% of pediatric patients had worn cosmetic contact lenses. Um, not surprisingly, 83% were female. 
two thirds had not been instructed on proper lens care. Half of them, more than half, stored them in water and did not rinse them after removing. And, you know, 15% borrowed them from someone else's, some from someone else. So it's scary and we need to act. So again, we are working through ECLA and through the University of Pittsburgh. We're working on education and advocacy. And uh, Tim Steineman, another member, is we're working with the FDA uh, and the CDC to try to get some to affect change. Um, and we've contacted state and fed federal authorities regarding the illegal, illegal sale of cosmetic contacts. So here's a poster that we made uh, where the patient wanted to look like this. And you can see the top picture. Instead, you know, I look like uh, decorative contact lenses cause inf eye infections and blindness. So we're trying to get the word out on social media, actually, to really inform um, these young, young adults that um, cosmetic contact lenses can definitely be a problem. So I, I think my time is, uh, is closing, so I'm just going to wrap things up. You know, when to add steroids, I think the SCUT trial really has gone through this nicely, and I think we all know the, the importance of the SCUT trial. The key is um, that you don't want to use uh, steroids in, in nocardia ulcers. That's the most important thing. And when you remember our patient, um, she ended up doing okay. She ended up looking okay and uh, recovered significant vision. And um, she was uh, pretty happy, did not have any LASIK enhancement at that point. So the pearls, um, proper management of contact lens related keratitis is important. We have to start with a careful assessment, aggressive treatment, and remember to modify treatment if you're not seeing a response in 48 hours. Only use steroids in non nocardia bacterial corneal ulcers educate our patients, avoid high-risk behaviors such as tap water and overnight wear, and remember the website, um, imicrobiology.upmc.com. And thank you so much for your attention. We'd like to invite you all to, to Pittsburgh. We are uh, building our uh, UPMC Vision Institute, and it should open in 2022 in Pittsburgh. So thank you so much for your attention. Thank you, thank you for that great talk. Um, I always learn a lot from Dr. Dollywall. Um, and they're entertaining too. So we're gonna have um, questions for the rest of the speakers at the end. Um, so if you have questions, just make a note of them and then we'll have a little discussion at the end. Um, and now I'm excited to introduce one of my colleagues, um, Dr. Hessen. She um, has, works with me at the Wilmer Eye Institute. And I actually was looking, thinking about it. I actually probably refer more patients to Dr. Hessen than anyone else at Wilmer um, because she specializes in patients with ocular surface disease and is a, a master at um, pros lenses as well as other scleral contact lenses, which have been such a game changer for, for so many of my patients. So she's gonna to talk to us about contact lens use and ocular surface disease. Okay, go ahead, Dr. Hi, good morning. Thank you so much for having me. I, it is a real honor to, um, to be here to talk with you guys about um, contact lenses and the use that we have for them if for treating patients with ocular surface disease. And you wanna share your screen. And let me get that shared, hold on just one second. Um, hold on one second. Um, there should be a green button at the bottom. Perfect. There we go. Thank you. All right. All right. Good morning. So I'm very excited to be here this morning and to talk to you about um, the use of contact lenses for ocular surface disease. I don't have any financial disclosures to report. So I'm going to talk a little bit first about soft bandage contact lenses, um, as they have largely replaced pressure patch um, as standard of care for treating patients with um, epithelial defects. 
Um, with the use of silicon hydrogel lenses, as you know, we have great oxygen permeability. So they're great options for patients that have injuries, ocular surface disease, and we often use them post-surgically. We use them extended wear for various periods of time, and it's often used in conjunction with um, typically topical antibiotics, but sometimes other medications as well as topical lubricants. So the benefits of bandage contact lenses is that we're able to maintain visual function while we're treating these patients, um, that we can treat the patient pretty easily with medications. We can easily observe and monitor the cornea for healing, um, and the, the lenses can be worn extended wear, and we can very easily remove them uh, should complications arise. So there are a number of indications for soft bandage contact lenses, including non-infectious um, epithelial defects, corneal abrasions, erosions, bullous keratopathy, uh, neurotrophic breakdowns, as well as a number of post-surgical indications, you know, after refractive surgery, after foreign body removal, where we disrupt the epithelium, and after glaucoma fil filtration surgeries in some cases. Uh, we use them for filamentary keratitis, the large diameter soft lenses, I think, are a great option in mitigating patient symptoms in those cases of su superior limbic keratitis, as well as various eyelid disorders where we use the lenses for protection of the cornea. We don't obviously want to use bandage contact lenses in those cases of infectious keratitis, as we just learned. Uh, we want to remove those lenses immediately. Um, contact lens related, related keratitis, um, severe ocular surface disease. When those patients have, um, when they're just bone dry and they don't have enough lubrication in the eye to support a soft lens, I think it's very dangerous, um, particularly over the long term, to utilize a bandaged contact lens. And in those patients that we um, are concerned about potential follow-up, uh, we don't wanna put a soft bandage lens obviously in a patient's eye that um, may not come back to their follow-up appointments. So there are a few different FDA approved uh, contact lenses for bandage contact lens. The AirOptics Night and Day is one I utilize very often, um, as well as the AccuView Oasis. And those um, both have two base curves that are FDA approved. Interestingly, the Pure Vision uh, contact lens, only the 8.6 is actually FDA approved for um, the soft bandage contact lens use. So now I'm going to switch gears a little bit and switch from the soft lenses to rigid gas permeable um, contact lenses in the use of ocular surface disease. So I really am excited to talk to you all about pros treatment, um, as it is one of my areas of expertise at, and one of my passions um, in utilizing to help patients with severe ocular surface disease. So PRO stands for prosthetic replacement of the ocular surface ecosystem, which is why we simply refer to it as PROS. It ser serves to restore vision, support healing, reduce patient symptoms, and dramatically improves, in many cases, patients' quality of life. These are FDA custom um, designed and fabricated prosthetic devices. And the design of these lenses is that they create a new smooth optical surface and there's this expanded tear reservoir that is between the lens and the cornea to provide necessary lubrication, all while being able to um, provide adequate oxygen to the eye. The, Unique thing about PROS devices is that it, the design of them utilizes the spline function. So we can manipulate any of the points to create a good contour or alignment to the globe. In addition, the PROS device is unique because it is able to be able to, um, it is able to be uh, cut into eight different meridians, which can easily be manipulated irrespective of the other meridians. So this is a great option in patients with very irregular sclerosis or conjunctiva, particularly those patients with panguecula, maybe temporal or nasal, where you need to have a different uh, contour of the lens in that area so as to not create compression and, and cause a panguiculitis. Also, these pros devices use the spline function to control the vault. Um, 
without without um, changing the base curve. And so this makes it a great option in using for patients who have advanced uh, corneal ectasias who also have ocular surface disease because you're able to bolt pretty much any cornea. So there are a number of ocular surface disease indications for pros. And um, as we know, we use um, pros or, or scleral lenses for the treatment of dry eye, um, particularly those that are associated with autoimmune conditions that tend to be more severe, like graft versus host, Sjogren's, um, status post LASIK, just to name a few. Um, in addition, those patients with neurotrophic corneas from various etiologies, including um, past herpetic infections. I use these lenses often in patients with corneal stem cell deficiency, as we see a number of patients with um, SJS, um, chemical and thermal burns, MMP, as well as aniridia at Wilmer. I also have at least a handful of patients um, that have done remarkably well with PROS devices that have ectodermal dysplasia. Um, it really improves their um, quality of life and activities of daily living. We use these lenses in patients with lag ophthalmos for various, um, various reasons to be able to protect the cornea and keep the epithelium intact, as well as to heal persistent epithelial defects. There was a retrospective um, chart review that was published in the um, AJO in um, 2000 of 49 patients and 76 eyes. As you can see, there's a number of different diagnoses associated with these, but the majority was Seaman Johnson syndrome. The mean follow-up is 33.6 months, and they use the scleral lens for daily wear in these patients. 53% of the eyes had improvement of two lines of best corrected visual acuity, eight out of 15 eyes with active corneal epithelial defects healed, and remarkably 92% of patients Im improved um, in their quality of life, including reduction in photophobia as well as discomfort. This is a photo of an eye um, that presented with vision of count fingers at two feet, which, re which improved to 2060. So this can be a great um, option for patients and really helps them to improve their quality of life as we improve their vision. This is a, a, a case of a 60 year old female who underwent um, blepharoplasty and she subsequently developed a lid retraction on the left eye. So she had an additional procedure, um, which unfortunately resulted in lag ophthalmos. And as you can see, severe exposure keratitis. Uh, this patient, as you can see, has really dense um, punctate epithelial erosions. And um, this is at the time of presentation. After insertion of a um, PROS device, um, four and a half hours later with removal, you can see that the epithelial cells really recovered um, fantastic. And uh, the patient is, is quite pleased with not only vision, but comfort. This is a patient of mine that is, um, we, we utilize PROS devices to, um, to heal persistent epithelial defect. It's a 49 year old Caucasian male who has a history of SJS and he has very typical presentation of um, keratinized lid margins, um, just severe ocular surface disease and shortened fornices. He um, unfortunately had penetrating keratoplasty uh, three times in the left eye, which led to perforation and a prosthesis. However, in the right eye, he also had a number of penetrating keratoplasties, and the, the most recent one was three months prior um, as a tectonic graft um, because of perforation. And this patient developed, again, a persistent epithelial defect. Um, it was not healing with lubrication and bandage soft contact lenses. So this is the patient's eye at the time of presentation. Vision was 2100. And um, as you can see, let me, uh, as you can see in the center there, there is a um, pretty large uh, epithelial defect taking up sodium fluorescine. And so, as I said, we decided to use the PROS um, device for extended wear uh, in this patient to heal the epithelial defect. So what I typically do is instill a drop of moxifloxacin in the reservoir of the PROS device and then top it off with saline, insert it on the patient's eye and have them wear it extended wear. And I follow them daily in the clinic. Uh, I remove the lens daily, uh, clean it, um, evaluate the cornea, 
and, um, and then typically uh, reinsert the lens. This defect um, improved actu actually after only four days, it was fully resolved. So here is day one, um, the, uh, the sodium fluorescein staining. Uh, day two, you can see it looks remarkably smaller. Uh, day three, there's a little bit of pooling, so it's not exactly um, um, a good picture to show that we were getting additional improvement. And by day four, it's pretty well fully uh, epithelialized, which is just amazing. Um, and here is day five. And I'm gonna leave you with a uh, retrospective review that was published in Cornea in 2007, actually by Debbie Jacobs, who's gonna be following me, um, and Perry Rosenthal. And this is a retrospective review of 33 patients. Um, and they evaluated the patient's um, symptoms, their quality of life, and their activities of daily living. And these patients all noted decrease in their ocular pain, um, reduction in photophobia and improvement in quality of life. And these are all chronic, chronic graft versus host patients treated with, um, with PROS devices. And as we all know that these patients can be very difficult to manage sometimes because their surfaces are just so poor. Um, as a matter of fact, that study showed that over 90% of the patients had reduction in pain, improvement in photophobia, improvement in quality of life, and improvement in activities of daily living, including driving and reading. There were no uh, cases of infectious keratitis reported in that study. So I think this, um, this lecture should, should um, serve to remind everyone that bandaged lenses um, not only soft, but also scleral lenses and pros devices are a great treatment modality for patients with uh, severe ocular surface disease. Thank you. Thank you so much for the wonderful talk. That was really, really nice. Um, so get ready with your questions for later. Um, I'm gonna introduce the next speaker, Dr. Deborah Jacobs, the contact lens guru. Is that right, Debbie? I can say that at least for us, okay. Um, Dr. Jacobs is a faculty at Corny uh, and Refractive Surgery Services and Director for Ocular Surface Imaging at the Mass Eye and Ear. She's an associate professor at the Harvard Medical School. Her main interests include ocular surface diseases, corneal ectasia, evidence-based medicine, use of contact lenses in health and disease, and giving ECLA her, you know, support forever and ever. Thank you so much for that, Debbie. She's gonna talk to us about therapeutic contact lenses for corneal ectasia. Thank you. Here we go. Thank you for that kind introduction. I don't know if uh, I'll live up to uh, guru status but uh, I'll do my best. Uh, let's see. Uh, I think this is working. Um, so here we go. Therapeutic uh, contact lenses for uh, corneal ectasia. Um, I have uh, only this disclosure uh, with tech lens. Um, I'm here uh, maybe preaching to the converted, but to tell you that a specialty contact lens is a new field within the United States optometry. Um, optometry graduates can do a residency in contact lens. This residency happens after four years of university education and four years for a doctorate in optometry. So it's a longer training than in most other countries around the world. And then this cornea and contact lens residency is an additional year. There are about 24 spots nationally. There are also residencies in ocular disease and some of our uh, specialists in uh, therapeutic contact lens come through that route as well. These optometrists typically train and work collaboratively with ophthalmologists in an integrated model of eye care. And um, this is the pattern in which, uh, let's say, Dr. Hessen and um, Christina Prescott uh, practice together at Wilmer. Globally, uh, the delivery of this type of care depends on the scope of practice within each country, as it varies from country to country. 
uh, whether they're optometrists, orthoptists, or opticians uh, fitting contact lenses. The specialty contact lens area is a growth area in the contact lens industry globally, whereas much other uh, contact lens sales are, are pretty flat. Um, so I think I explain all this because um, I want ophthalmologists to be aware of this innovation in specialty lenses that may be different from even a decade ago uh, for those who trained more recently. So what are the specialty lenses? There are RGP cornea lenses, uh, the keratoconus design specifically, there are piggyback systems, silicone hydrogel, hybrid lenses, scleral lenses, and then the highly customized lenses and scleral uh, prosthetic devices such as a prose. So, um, to go through them quickly, the uh, cornea lenses, the keratoconus designs are what are commonly called Rose K lenses. People think that encompasses all of them, but actually that's just a brand. They are too numerous to name, many, many others. The newer ones have innovative base curves to accommodate the shape of the cone. And some of them have innovative optics now that can de neutralize the characteristic decentration and coma that occurs in keratoconus. The back surfaces can be toric, so those are called dual aspheric designs where the front and back can be aspheric. They have increased uh, stability and comfort. And there is literature from the last decade or so showing that uh, using this dual aspheric curve, you can have a greater likelihood of uh, more than 12 hours a day of wear. Now, a piggyback is a hard lens worn over a soft lens, and there are infinite varieties and combinations. There can be soft lens with plus that stabilizes the RGP with minus to flatten the apex and reduce the power required, or they can have a carrier feature that the lens sits in. The problem with all of these arrangements is that the double lens uh, contributes to hypoxia because uh, there's more material to go through and often to accomplish the stability, the lens has to be thick, uh, either in the center or periphery, which each can create different uh, hypoxic challenges. The newer high DK materials are helpful, but again, hypoxia handling issues and complicated care regimens are a challenge. There are um, new custom sci-high soft lenses that folks aren't aware of that can be used in keratoconus. And um, a few brands are listed, the Kerasoft, the Novacone. I don't know the names of the brands uh, in Asia, but I imagine these are available. Uh, they have some interesting features. They're a little larger than most soft lenses, rigid modulus. They're all high DK. So they create a mini vault and they can be customized to sit properly on the eye. And here are uh, two more recent publications about these lenses from Spain and Turkey, respectively. And these allow some keratoconic patients to stay in soft lenses longer. And uh, that's, a, that's a big plus. So you're not gonna use these for the most advanced cones, but for patients who were already soft lens wearers, maybe were in torax and then someone figured out it's KC and not plain old astigmatism, we can often uh, buy more time with this category of lenses. So they definitely have a role, uh, but they require some expertise on the part of the fitter. So, so it's a big advance over toric soft lenses. Now, hybrid lenses can also be used in keratoconus and there's publications from the US and Spain on that. They're definitely advantage over uh, RGPs because uh, they're stable and the patients don't feel the edge. They now are different designs for uh, keratoconus, for post-op astigmatism, for um, post-refractive surgery, and uh, they have different features as to the design. These are high DK, um, but unfortunately they develop what I call a non-physiologic fit. They adhere and have suction. And so patients get into problems with uh, adherence of lens, ulceration, and sometimes new vessels related more to the mechanical issue than pure hypoxia. I'm gonna uh, finish up with a little extra attention uh, on scleral lenses near and dear to my heart. I was part of the team that uh, helped uh, 
increase awareness, availability, and appreciation for pros lenses. I was at Boston Sight for over a decade, although uh, I have not been affiliated uh, for several years. I highly recommend this uh, online free text, which is a guide to scleral lens fitting. Um, these days, we just use scleral lens to talk about any lens that runs about 15 to 18 millimeters. And the distinction between minis and cornea sclerals is falling away, although I believe there are distinctions, but from a marketing purpose, it's easier to call them all sclerals. And I've listed a few brands, but is by no means uh, an exhaustive list. The goal with these is to achieve a scleral fit that is no corneal touch. Um, I think that the ones that are smaller diameter seal rather than are fluid ventilated and sclerals that seal may develop suction, clouding of the reservoir, haze, and if the vault is too high uh, and it's sealed, uh, there may be a tendency toward hypoxia. What isn't discussed much is that some of these smaller lenses have a narrow bearing zone at the limbus and particularly for uh, ocular surface disease, grafts, uh, challenged eyes, there may be complications. And this was recognized early uh, by colleagues in LA who published on their experience with mini scleral lenses. So now there is generally increased awareness, acceptance, and availability of scleral lenses. I guess my work at Boston Sight succeeded. Uh, Muriel Shornack did a very, very excellent uh, scleral lens literature review in 2015 that I highly recommend. And now there are increased number of clinicians who are comfortable fitting these lenses and growing acceptance as an option uh, for corneal RGP lens intolerance and keratoconus. So in the bad old days, the doctor would diagnose uh, keratoconus, send them to a lens fitter who would put them in RGPs for as long as the patient or the fitter could tolerate it. And then when that didn't work, they went back to the surgeon, had a cornea transplant. When they didn't see well, they went back for RGP lenses, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, and nobody was very happy. Uh, and uh, scleral lenses and pros have changed all that. Uh, and here are publications on the Jupiter lenses from uh, nearly a decade ago, two different centers at the U in the US. Um, PROS, which uh, Dr. Hessen described beautifully, was developed at Boston Sight. And in the interest of time, I'm going to click through all of this um, since you know about it, and I'm running late. Um, basically, uh, in 2010, we published our 2006 experience with pros across all diagnoses, and uh, there was huge improvement in vision, five lines roughly for ectasia and astigmatism, two lines in ocular surface disease. It's not that it doesn't work for ocular surface disease, but what there's called is a ceiling effect, where if a patient comes in with SBK and 2040, they can't improve five lines. There's only two lines to go. So basically, huge impact in acuity, and most important, more than 20 lines improvement on the NEIVFQ. And that was regardless of whether this was a Taser and astigmatism, or ocular surface disease. A few years later at Boston site with a group of colleagues, we reviewed a six month cohort just with keratoconus. Uh, and we studied uh, the results of 89 eyes and 59 patients. Same scale of improvement as we found in a cohort uh, two years earlier, but most importantly, we showed that 88% of the eyes were wearing the device at six months. This is a huge success rate for specialty lens in, in advanced eyes. The interesting thing we found is that failure did not correlate with the steepness of the cone because of the vault control that Dr. Hessen described. Um, you can uh, raise the height of the lens uh, over any cone. No cone was too steep to be fit. And uh, grafted cones could also be fit. And for those of us who fit these eyes, we know that the problem is out at the graftose interface where there is continued ectasia and ordinary sclerals would bear down there. But with pros, you have a, a, a substantial vault control uh, and you can deal with this peripheral thinning. Then to get out of uh, Boston site itself, there emerged data from uh, a pro site at the University of uh, Michigan, Kellogg, and they looked retrospectively 
uh, at prose versus keratoplasty for ectasia, they looked back at two years at a single site, had 37 eyes in each group, uh, which was by coincidence. It wasn't a design study. That's how many fell in each group of patients with advanced keratoconus referred for either prose or keratoplasty. Any eye sent for uh, prose could be fitted. The vision was better and it was faster to get there than after PK. And uh, there were few case, fewer complications than after PK. And there were some doc uh, patients included in that cohort as well. Since then, um, from uh, Belgium, Karina Kampen and colleagues reported their experience and found retrospectively that scleral lenses reduced the need for cornea transplants. And they found that the need for keratoplasty in these patients with advanced disease was halved. Uh, and again, this year from colleagues in, in um, again in Michigan, looking retrospectively, they found that referring keratoconic patients for scleral or RGP contact lens reduced the risk of keratoplasty by 80%, putting the surgeons out of business. Uh, maybe we don't want to hear it, but it's doing that. And interestingly, that the need to go ahead with keratoplasty wasn't associated with the maximum K. That is, there were other factors, often socioeconomic, uh, that uh, had to do with who ended up getting keratoplasty. It's disappointing that it was disproportionately young Black men. I'm not sure what that says uh, in our society, but it probably does say something. Um, there's no data yet on. Uh, iPrint Pro, which is molded and then undergoes a digital custom design. Uh, hopes are high that this would uh, help uh, with RGP corneal failures, but there isn't a single source of good uh, longitudinal data on keratoconus with this modality yet. Um, further considerations, keratoconus patients can attain good vision despite, despite axial opacities. This is a 2025 eye in a uh, prose lens. Uh, and this would be a bad case for keratoplasty. There are peripheral vessels and there's ongoing atopy. So the new algorithm is that you really should assess vision in a specialty lens before deciding for surgery even if the pupil uh, is obscured uh, because the reduced vision may be mostly optical and not media. Furthermore, high drops can be rehabilitated with a scleral lens. In some places, patients who have high drops are told they're not gonna recover good vision. They go right for keratoplasty. Uh, many of them do recover good vision. Uh, they flatten sometimes after high drops and they can still be fitted um, with a scleral lens. And again, this has been published uh, by colleagues uh, in, uh, Antwerp, it's my own personal experience and hot off the presses, there's experience uh, of this uh, coming out of India. Um, finally, uh, scars can remodel when surface barrier function is restored with a prose lens. And this is at the top of a woman in her 50s who wore every manner of specialty lens for keratoconus and ended up looking like that, which would not be great prognosis for keratoplasty. And after four years of prose, she was 2025, vessels and haze had regressed. And this is work we published from Boston site nearly a decade ago. So, Keratoplasty for keratoconus is a paradox. It's generally successful, but there's low patient satisfaction. Why is that? Well, they compare with the fellow eye. They compare with their historical RGP vision, which is excellent. There's a high rate of graft astigmatism, even typically for diopters, even with excellent surgeons and even with DALC. Up to 40% of post-ops are contact lens dependent in keratoconus. The new paradigm for keratoconus, and these are my clinical pearls, is to consider that a patient's not a contact lens failure without trial of specialty lenses. The new designs and materials are more comfortable and give a physiologic fit. There are good examples of why each of these can help. Uh, and finally, that large scleral and post treatment uh, are um, successful independent of steepest K. So I don't need to know what the K is to say whether pros will work. Doesn't matter if it's 70, it will. And the main message is no graph for keratoconus without a trial of specialty lens uh, first. Uh, 
There's an editorial from Ophthalmology uh, 2016 showing that PK is decreasing in the US, partly because of shift to DSEC and DMEC, partly because of earlier referral for cross-linking, which is delaying or eliminating the need, but also realizing that there's increased acceptance of specialty lenses as an option for contact lens intolerance. New paradigm, a patient is not a contact lens failure without a trial of specialty lenses. Thank you very much. I'm sorry if I've run over and I look forward to answering questions at the end. Okay, I think we're gonna save our questions to the end. So um, thank you for those great talks. And I like that they, they, seem, they went together and complement each other very nicely. Um, now we're going to switch gears just a little bit, and we're going to talk about um, myopia management. This is something that, and I, you know, with COVID and all the homeschooling, I think is only going to get get more prevalent. Um, so I think this is especially timely and of interest, um, hopefully, to, to everybody. So first up, we're going to have um, Dr. Koffler. He's an associate professor of ophthalmology at the University of Kentucky, and also practices in a private group called Huffman and Huffman in Lexington, Kentucky. He's the past president of ECLA and also the International Medical Contact Lens Council. He's currently our international chair, so um, a great person to talk to if you're interested in getting involved. Um, and he has practiced orthokeratology since 2002. So, um, so really one of the pioneers in the field um, has written a lot on this and spoken on it. So we're, we're very fortunate that he is gonna be our, our speaker and educate us on, on this. All right, take it away, Dr. Koffler. Thank you, Christina. Yeah. Uh, we see your screen. You see my screen. Okay. I do not, so let me see. But it looks like you're on slide three of the screen. Hmm. Let's see if I can get back here. Sir, once uh, so, uh, stop set and uh, then start uh, the sharing session. Okay, how am I doing now? Can you all see the screen? Okay, great. Well, thank you very much for, for having me. And uh, this has been a, a very exciting symposium so far. All the sp I've enjoyed all the uh, previous speakers. What I'm gonna to talk to you uh, today about is orthokeratology, contact lenses and their relationship to myopia control. Um, this is a topic dear to my heart. And uh, if nothing else, um, uh, the true message of this is that I hope ophthalmologists will open up uh, their, their eyes, if you will, no pun intended, um, to what we're going to talk about today because um, I really feel like uh, orthokeratology um, is um, a very viable entity and is critical in treating children particularly, but also adults, um, in relationship to uh, myopia. So um, here are my financial coaches. I've been on the Speaker Bureau for both Paragon, uh, Vision Sciences, which is now part of Cooper Vision, and also for Bausch and Loam in the past. I've uh, kind of done this in a little bit of a question and answer uh, type of uh, talk. And uh, the nice part is I'm going to give you the question and I'm also going to give you the answer. So um, the first question is, uh, is there uh, a, myo a myopia epidemic? And the answer, uh, or, or the question is, uh, there is no myopia epidemic. The answer to that is really, uh, that's false. There really is a myopia epidemic. Uh, Dr. Uh, Holden um, showed us this um, in a publication somewhere around 2016, where he indicated that uh, this trend of increasing myopia is rather dramatic. And uh, we will see close to 5 billion myopes uh, uh, globally by the year 2050. And uh, Penny Asbell, who was previous editor of the, uh, our journal uh, in an editorial in 2016, noted uh, the same kind of forecast, that there's gonna be a 50% increase in myopia 
um, between the year 2000 and the year 2050. Um, most of us would consider this an epidemic. Uh, in the United States, here are the numbers in 1979, um, when, when I went through uh, my training, um, we always thought of myopia as being 25%. We're now talking about myopia being 50% in the United States. India, uh, the, the numbers are, are lower, but the trend is somewhat the same. Uh, currently, uh, according to the All India Institute of Medical Science report in 2021, there's a 13% prevalence rate in school age children in India. In the 1970s, this was published to be 5%. They also note that the uh, incidence has doubled over the last 10 years. And you can see globally in 2010, we had 2 billion myopes. In 2015, we had 50% increase about. 5 billion myopes. The next question is, I believe in the push-pull theory for corneal epithelial cell movements. And I suspect most of us have no idea what the push-pull theory is, so let's talk about that. But yes, I believe this is true. I do believe in the push-pull theory. This is the current theory that most uh, of uh, our, the active orthokeratologists are going by. And it has to be combined, obviously, with a 360-degree seal of the lens. Now, remember, this lens, we talk about it as being a mold. Uh, we are molding the cornea. We're changing the shape of the cornea, but we're doing it in a very defined manner. How exactly does this push-pull theory work? Well, OrthoK uses a rigid gas permeable corneal mold, and it harnesses hydraulic forces under that mold to reshape the cornea through overnight reducing or eliminating refractive error for a period of time. And so centrally, we've got a positive push, push down onto the cornea where we're flattening. And then we have to have a zone where we have this negative pull force. We call this a sagittal zone or the intermediate zone. So here we are pushing down. Usually we'll get about four to eight microns of, uh, of uh, effect. And we're also in the mid periphery have these pull forces that create the steep reverse curve. So here's the concept of the push pull theory. Now, the secrets of the parameters of, of these contact lenses really are not that foreign, particularly since our previous two speakers kind of set this all up for us. Um, we have kind of created not exactly a reverse curve, but uh, um, in, in essence, we've, we've done something similar to that. The base curve gives the push, and so we can design this as a certain amount of flattening to our central keratometry reading. And then we have to give some space for this epithelial movement to go, and this is the reverse curve. We also end up here with some alignment curves in order to get this lens back onto the surface of the eye and then a little bit of a peripheral curve so that the contact won't be quite so tight. Let's talk a little bit about the base curve. This becomes the treatment zone. And how do we calculate the base curve? It's very simple. We just take the flat K and we calculate the prescription that we want to be corrected, let's say two diopters. And we take uh, sometimes in, in the higher corrections, there's a little bit of a little Jensen factor that we throw in there. But that gives us the base curve of an ortho K mold. So let's just take a, a typical 43 flat curve. We want to correct two diopters. We would be looking at a 41 K base curve. What about the uh, reverse curve? What does that do for us? Well, the reverse curve joins this flat base curve to the alignment curve, and it creates the hydraulic pull where we get a thickening of cells in this area. And this is where myopia is often controlled. The nice part about this reverse curve is that it improves our centration for the treatment and it creates a sagittal depth. So we're able to move this curve up and down and we can control this. The alignment curve controls where the mold lands on the eye, keeps the mold centered, controls movement, and is often based on the eccentricity values. So here is a, a typical um, diagram that I'm using from the Paragon people, um, it gives, and, and all lenses pretty much have the same kind of concept. It gives a central six millimeter treatment zone. It gives a one millimeter uh, reverse zone, and it gives a one millimeter landing zone. 
So the total lens starts off about a 10 millimeter lens. And then probably there's a little bit to the posterior edge ellipse on the very edge here. So we use usually somewhere in the 10 to 9 mil, uh, uh, 10 to 11 millimeter um, uh, ax, um, uh, diameters. You can see it on sagittal profile. This, re, this return zone right here this, in the blue, this is really kind of critical. And all lenses from different companies may have different kinds of concepts mathematically, but there is some kind of return zone to these lenses. Here it is uh, in, in, in a profile where we want to make the point that we can control this return zone. We can return, control the sagittal depth. We can lay it down flatter, we can raise it up higher. And it's, a, it's nice to have this mathematical control when we're ordering the lens. This is nice to see this um, on a uh, kind of OCT profile, anterior segment, where you can see how this lens flattens right here, pushing down, and we're, we're anticipating a little flat, uh, a little steepening of the corneal epithelium here in the sagittal zone return zone. And of course, fluorescein patterns are critical to use in this to see how, how we are, are doing. Oftentimes, we'll have the patient come in with the contact lens on first thing in the morning, take the lens off and see what what uh, centration we're having and what kind of bullseye effect we're having with the fluorescein. The next question is, there is a better theory of mechanism of action over hyperopic to focus. Is there a better theory? Well, I don't think so. I think we're still using hyperopic to focus as the reason why these lenses work. Um, and it, this is particularly true for myopia control. So now we're going to talk a little bit and get into a little bit of myopic control. And you can't start that without some of the critical work by Dr. Earl Smith from the University of Houston, um, who, working, who was working with monkey models in 2009. And he described the importance of focusing an image on the mid-peripheral retina. He described the concept of positive and negative uh, control of curvature, um, hyperopic versus myopic defocus. He showed, uh, or later on, this was verified with growing chick models, and we are looking forward to new animal models to be developed. So let's go and talk a little bit about what Earl Smith told us. Here's some uh, concepts of that bullseye pattern of orthokeratology, where we're looking at the flattening and we're looking at a little mid-peripheral uh, thickening and increase in curvature. Now remember the critical part about this whole thing is that we're developing two curves, one curve for the central fovea and a second curve to fall on mid-peripheral retina. That is the whole uh, excitement of this work. And Dr. Smith said in an article in 2005 in Investigative Ophthalmology that eye growth may possibly be retarded or halted through a precise and predetermined optical system at the corneal plane that will manipulate the peripheral optics of the eye. And here's his monkey uh, model. Uh, the monkeys um, were studied over uh, roughly uh, 150 days to 300 days, I guess, for maturity of their optics. And one of the things that Dr. Uh, Smith did was he first took a model where uh, he wanted to know, does the fovea control the axial growth of the eye? And here he lasered the fovea so that the fovea was wiped out, and we're just kind of using mid-peripheral uh, retina. And what he found here is that the intact fovea was not that important to reaching emetropia, and that these monkey eyes all seem to reach the zero emetropia level. Now, what happened if he did the opposite? What happened if he kind of wiped out the mid-peripheral retina with uh, laser marks and just was working on a fovea. So the fovea here is okay, but the mid-peripheral retina is wiped out. And he did that uh, with a YAG laser. And here he found that these peripheral wipeout abrasions were all over the place. And they never went on to reach emetropia, even after 300 days in the monkey model. So 
The conclusions were that peripheral form deprivation, wiping out the periphery, can produce myopia to fovea, that the fovea was really not essential for reaching amortization. Conclusion is the intact periphery is essential. What does this mean? It really means, again, that the data demonstrate that the fovea does not play the dominant role in refractive development, and instead, peripheral retinal images play the major role in determining overall eye growth. So what we want to do is we want to make sure that we have an image coming in focus on the mid-peripheral retina. The concept is that we can control axial length that the eye does not have the tendency to want to grow. This was, again, mentioned uh, in the chick model. Chicks mature very quickly within days in their optical system. And here, Dr. Uh, Liu and uh, Walsot at UC Berkeley placed certain lenses on these chicks to mimic central and peripheral defocus. The lenses were worn for five to 17 days. And in these two groups of, uh, with a bifocal design, if they had central defocus versus peripheral defocus, the peripheral defocus showed the greatest difference in axial eye growth. Again, if you wipe out the periphery, the eyes tend to get longer. And then we'd like to talk a little bit for the moment about what we're doing with the correction of myopia. So typically here, we're just putting our, our regular kind of prescribed myopic pair of glasses on. And, uh, and we're getting the image from being a myopic image onto the fovea. But what happens here in the mid periphery? You're moving away from the curvature of the eye. You've got what we call hyperopic defocus. And this is what we need to solve. And now we're developing lenses, spectacle lenses, that will have an increasing positive power in the mid periphery to get this image back into the eye, into and onto the surface of the mid peripheral retina. A couple of other concepts. Um, what about reduction of myopia progression in different treatments? If we look at right here, orthokeratology in the middle, you'll see that the meta-analyses of many, many studies showed about 45%. Dr. Cooper, who's done a lot of uh, study in this area of uh, axial length progression and particularly with atrophy, but here you see that 45% in even his study have a, a reduction in axial length. Compared this to low dose atropine, it's a, roughly about the same. If you go to higher doses of atropine, you get a little better effect. But we know as we go to higher doses of atropine, we get increasing um, uh, problems with the children tolerating it. If you go down in multifocal soft lenses, you got a decreasing amount number until single vision glasses do nothing in terms of reduction of axial length. What about overnight ortho K compared to atropine controlling myopia? Well, the conclusion of this particular study by Lin and, and cohorts um, in, in China was that ortho K lenses is a definitely useful method for controlling myopia progression, even in high myopia patients. And this certainly has been our clinical experience. What about the suppressive effect of combined atropine uh, along with orthokeratology? Well, they tend to work well. So the combined treatment, the conclusion here, the combined treatment of orthok and low-dose atropine installation to axial length elongation um, <clears throat> showed that okay alone in childhood myopia um, uh, could be extended by the use of atropine, that the effect would be greater if you used the combination of both, if you weren't getting total control with your ortho K patient. Is ortho K safe to use in children? This is certainly a big issue. I think it is. And we used Mark Bullimore's um, uh, retrospective study of a large number of patients, over 1,300 patients representing 2,600 patient years of wear. There are only two events of microbial keratitis. This results in an estimated incidence of microbial keratitis of 7.7 .7 per 10,000 years of wear. Compare this, if you will, to your traditional soft contact lens wear and extended wear, which is much higher. <clears throat> Here's a, a, another larger uh, systemic review 
uh, by you and cohorts um, in eye and contact lens back in 2016. There, um, basic points is that there is sufficient evidence to suggest that ortho K is a safe option for myopia correction and retardation. But also critical is, and we learned this from uh, problems in China around 2007, 2008, when lens care and good compliance were not being uh, followed and, and instructed. Fortunately, the Chinese government made moves to make this um, a compliance, um, a strict regimen, and we are not hearing in, uh, of problems with this. But the safety protocol is critical with the use of these lenses. No tap water ever. Have to use a surface uh, cleaner. Rinse with a multi-purpose solution or sterile saline. And we like to use hydrogen peroxide disinfection. Obviously, you have to follow these patients closely, but once they are stable, I still watch them every six months. <clears throat> and they're instructed to return if they have any pain light sensitivity or redness. The next question, there is adequate evidence-based literature to prove that ortho K slows axial length progression in children. Can we, can we prove this? I think the answer is true. Look at these studies. We have study of uh, Harioka, which is a five-year study, and then we have multiple other study, two-year studies that have gone on both in Spain and Japan and China and the United States, all of which show that we can get effect with ortho K and myopia control and axial length. But I'd like to show this one real briefly. This is a 10-year study. This is a long-term study in Japan uh, by Hirioka's group. And what they show basically is, and this is refractive uh, correction, that every year there was a, a, a definite increase when you went with soft contact lenses in terms of axial length. And it was a statistically increased uh, amount every year for the first six years. But in ortho K, there was no statistically significant increase in axial length over any of the 10 years. So I think if you're looking for long-term studies, the Japanese are giving this to us and they have ter tremendous follow-up. The next question, it really does not matter what lens design you pick. I think the answer to that is false. We have 17 different FDA companies that had different lenses. And the, the concept here is all of these are good. All of these are useful. Some are touted to be better for higher myopia than others. Some have a stigmatism control built into it. Um, but we have many, many different systems. If you're not successful for one system, we hope that you'll be knowledgeable enough to, to work with a second system. Wearing of ortho K lenses positively affects the quality of life and behaviors in children. Does, does, does this really happen? Well, I think there have been some nice studies to show that this is true, that the investigation of the effects of ortho K lenses on the quality of life in children were looked at by Zao and, and published an eye and contact lens in 2018, where 100 children were studied over three-month periods in, in, in China. There were significantly significant uh, increased scores in self-confidence, willingness to try new things, more active in sports and entertainment, and increased total time spent outdoors when children were using ortho K lenses for overnight wear and instructed to get out and play. Here are the reasons given by uh, kids um, for choosing ortho K lenses, convenience in sports, classmates' recommendations, appearance, and other variety of reasons. They were very favorable in, 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 in this blue zone. Um, a large number acceptable to the patient, uh, to the kids' attitudes, to the lenses. And we did have about a 25% incidence where the, the kids either were unaccepted or strong resistance to wearing. So in summary, I would like just to have you open up your, your eyes, if you will, to this modality. This is not new anymore. This is being used uh, throughout the world. Uh, there are millions of kids now and adults in ortho K lenses successfully. I personally, since 2002, with good strong follow-up in my practice, have had no cases of microbial keratitis. And I believe that it's time for us to start to look at the literature and recommend this modality to our children. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Koffler. 
I'm going to introduce the next speaker, Dr. Varsha Rati from LV Prasad Institute um, in Hyderabad. Dr. Rati uh, joined the LVPI, the prestigious LVPI in the 20, 2007. Her areas of interest are eczema surgery, including LASIK, PRK, and contact lenses. Most importantly, she is the coordinator for the uh, acclaimed Indian contact lens education program. And she's going to talk to us about non-infected complications of soft contact lenses. Dr. Rati, please. There is one more talk before me. I, I, I think Dr. Waleen is next. Oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> I'm, I'm so yeah. sorry. Yeah. I apologize, Dr. I didn't mean to. You got a preview. <laughs> All right, okay. Well, forget about what I just said. Our next speaker is Dr. Jeffrey Walling. Is the Associate Dean for Research at the Ohio State University College of Optometry. He received his doctorate of, uh, Doctor of Optometry degree from the University of California and his master's and PhD degrees from the Ohio State University College of Optometry. He's, uh, Dr. Walling has led several uh, pediatric contact lens studies and he's the study chair of the bifocal lenses um, in the BLINK study, which is an NEI-sponsored randomized controlled trial to investigate the myopia control effects of soft contact lenses, the multifocal lenses. And Dr. Wallin is going to talk to us about soft lenses for myopia control. Thank you so much. Thank you, and thank you to ECLA for the invitation. I really do appreciate it. I do want to give a disclosure in that I receive um, research materials from Dash and Lama. I receive um, uh, contact lens solutions for our soft multifocal contact lens randomized clinical trial. Um, I read the myopia control literature all the time. And so I want to sort of try and summarize it for people. And this is my attempt at doing so. Um, we generally talk about uh, myopia control in terms of percent slowing, but I think we're sort of changing from that. And what I've done here is taken a look at how much we slow eye growth in an absolute manner and how much we slow myopia progression. And I've put them on a similar scale so that about a 10th of a millimeter of eye growth equals a quarter of a diopter of myopia progression. And then I have looked at all of the studies in the various types of myopia control. So including multifocal contact lenses, which we'll talk about today, orthokeratology, which Bruce just talked about, uh, multifocal spectacles, low concentration atropine, high concentration atropine, parenzepine, undercorrection of myopia, and gas permeable contact lenses. And what you can see is that mo soft multifocal contact lenses sort of are in the middle of the range. And the nice thing is, is that they slow down both refractive error progression and axial elongation by about the same amount. Whereas in, for example, atropine, you generally get much better slowing of myopia progression than you do of axial elongation. And of course, with orthokeratology, we just can't measure myopia progression because we're temporarily reducing that, but you get very good um, slowing of eye growth. But of course, we're here to talk about soft multifocal contact lens myopia control, same exact um, uh, uh, slide or uh, graph as you saw before, but now I break out all of the individual soft multifocal contact lens studies. I divide them up by the amount of time that the study was um, conducted, so three-year studies, two-year two studies, one-year studies, and then I took the overall weighted average of each one of these and found that soft multifocal contact lenses on average over the course of the studies, and they were on average a little over two years long, slow uh, refractive error progression by about a third of a diopter and slow eye growth by about 0.15 millimeters. And that's essentially what you would expect on sort of a one-to-one -one ratio. But when we talk about soft multifocal contact lenses, there are lots of the different types available, but we are specifically talking about center distance design. That means that the center of the contact lens is aimed at um, correcting the myopic refractive error that patients have so that they can see a distance. And then, then, then in the mid periphery of the contact lens, we have relative plus power, either in distinct zones as shown here in this concentric design lens, or in relative in an increase in relative plus power as you get as you go out towards the more peripheral part of the lens. This is what I call a gradient design. And there's not a lot of center distance soft multifocal contact lenses available, but these are the ones that are available that I know of. It's not a comprehensive list, but I think it does show us that 
there are lots of different modalities that we can use. There's lots of different design styles that you can use depending on what you're most comfortable with. And this even includes um, uh, one contact lens that's a hybrid contact lens. As Dr. Koffler showed just a moment ago, um, when we correct people with single vision contact lenses or glasses, we put the focus of light right on the retina so that they can see clearly. But we tend to, because the eye is longer than it is wide, we tend to put the focus of light behind the retina with single vision correction. With these multifocal contact lenses and that relative plus power in the mid periphery, instead of focusing light behind the retina, we focus it in front of the retina. Therefore, it acts as a signal to the eye to slow eye growth, but still provides clear vision centrally. So that's sort of how the, we think these soft multifocal contact lenses work. I talked about the two different designs, the concentric design and the gradient design. And what I did was looked at the literature and took the average um, percent slowing of myopia progression and axial elongation for the concentric design lenses and compared it to the gradient design lenses. And you can see that at least in this initial look, it looks like concentric design lenses might work better than gradient design lenses. However, um, that's just an initial look. There has been no direct comparison of these types of contact lenses. So it's not something that I would only fit people in concentric design contact lenses. Um, as a matter of fact, you'll see in just a moment that um, at least from a, a pair of studies, gradient design works as well. I think this was a very important study because it was a contralateral design study, which I typically don't like, but I think this was important for um, one specific reason. And that's where they put one eye in a multifocal design contact lens and one or and the other eye in single vision contact lenses and they followed them over time. When they did that, the eyes wearing the multifocal contact lenses progressed slower. If these contact lenses work because they reduce accommodative effort or if they work because they reduce accommodative lag, then they would work in both eyes, even though you only put a contact, a multifocal contact lens in one eye, because we know that accommodation is yoked between the two eyes. So if you slow, if you reduce it in one eye, you're gonna reduce it in the other. And so it would work similarly in both eyes, but it only worked in the eye wearing the multifocal contact lens, telling us it's probably something about the optics of the contact lens that um, slows myopia progression. It's probably that myopic defocus we talked about earlier. So this is a large scale um, multi-center randomized clinical trial conducted with a concentric design contact lens. And you can see a meaningful slowing of both myopia progression and axial elongation. Um, and this is over a three year period in uh, I believe eight to 11 year old children. And then a second study was done that was also a randomized clinical trial this time in seven to 11 year old children where we fit the kids with, with um, 250 ad contact lenses, oops, sorry, with 250 ad contact lenses, 150 ad contact lenses and single vision. And we got very similar results in terms of comparing the 250 ad contact lenses to single vision. And you'll see that in just a moment. But the important point to take away from the study is that the 250 ad contact lenses um, provided a meaningful slowing of both myopia progression and axial elongation, but the 150 lenses were 150 ad contact lenses were not meaningfully different from the uh, single vision contact lenses in either axial elongation or myopia progression. And then this is just the overall results from the two studies looking at the adjusted results. Um, you can see that there's less than a quarter of a diopter difference between those two contact lens modalities or, or designs over a three year period and less than 0 .05, or a 0.05 millimeter difference, which equates to less than a quarter of a diopter difference in terms of eye growth. So really, this isn't a direct comparison again, but it does show that you know we've, what I showed before and that concentric designs may work better, it may not ultimately be true. We, haven't ha we don't have a direct comparison, but I think it's at least justification for a study to um, take a look at that. One of the questions people have is, by fitting kids with multifocal contact lenses, are we affecting their vision? And this is in the beginning of our study where we had 300 kids, almost 300 kids, who we put soft multifocal contact lenses on with the 250 ad for just a short period of time. They had to show us that they would get good enough vision in order to be in the study. And we compared that to their vision with single vision spectacles, a new 
a new manifest refraction. And you can see that the overlap is dramatic. There's really no meaningful differences. And when we take a look at the averages, they are identical. Both result in better than 2020 um, vision on average. And the two results are actually identical. And other studies have found that as well. As well. Um, Pete Kohlbaum and colleagues at Indiana University also found that high contrast um, uh, distance visual acuity is similar between both the dual focus and the multifocal or what I call gradient design contact lenses. And it's similar to glasses where they did find a difference was in low contrast visual acuity in that both of the multifocal designs resulted in about three to four letter decrease in visual acuity as compared to single vision glasses. And we actually found the same thing in our study, but it was a, just a two letter difference between the multifocal contact lenses and the single vision contact lenses. So really not meaningful at all. And then of course, we're always worried about the safety. And when you look at the safety profile of contact lenses, this is looking at age and the per, uh, percentage of patients with either a discontinuation of contact lenses or with an experience of a corneal infiltrative event. And you can see we routinely fit college age kids with contact lenses, but they're actually a much higher risk group than these young kids who are progressing in myopia. So with all of that, I would say we aren't causing amblyopia with these contact lenses. We're certainly not affecting their vision much at all. Um, they do provide effective myopia control. Remember, when fitting these contact lenses, fit the higher ad power if multiple ad powers exist, and kids really can wear them safely. Thank you very much. Great, thank you. And we already had our introduction for our final speaker. So um, without hesitation, since we're running a little behind, we will um, have Dr. Rothy give her um, talk. Can, can everyone hear? I can't, I can't seem to hear Varsha. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Now we can, yeah, now we can. I was wondering, I'm the only one who's unable to start from the, yeah. yeah. So hello everyone. Uh, in the next few minutes, I'll take you through non-infective complications of contact lenses, which include uh, inflammatory and mechanical. A majority of these are self-limiting and uh, can be easily managed by contact lens practitioners as well as patients. We have heard the serious and symptomatic one by Dr. Dhaliwal, the microbial keratitis, and the others which are significant and symptomatic, uh, which can result in contact lens uh, discontinuation either temporary or permanent, or uh, they can be asymptomatic on, and on routine examination, we can see these. This is a this is a collaborative research which was done in LVPI and CCLRU uh, for almost uh, ten years. Data was collected and uh, followed up for twelve months. And this paper was published way back. Uh, we have uh, incidence of uh, adverse events in Delhi were as one point four percent and extended where it was higher seven close to seven percent. Going to the individual adverse events that is contact lens induced acute red eye that's clear. Uh, there are no symptoms before eye closure and patient wakes up in the morning, he would notice pain, redness, watering, irritation and discharge. And the eye would have uh, signs of diffuse infiltration from periphery to mid periphery. Small focal infiltrates will be there uh, and uh, there won't be any significant staining. It is usually unilateral and recurrent episodes can happen of clay. Uh, at the event, what we found was significant levels of gram negative and gram positive contamination on contact lenses. These were various organisms, but only 28% of these patients with significant levels had events. But they were, there was varied presentation, like in some we could see petechial hemorrhages of focal congestion, and some patients had discharge. It was more common in extended wear patients compared to daily wear contact lenses. And what we thought was uh, it was because of the uh, bacteria which come from the upper respiratory tract or gut. In open eye, they are flushed out. And in closed eye, there is buildup of toxin which can lead to red eye. Uh, the treatment here is discontinuation of contact lens wear and almost 100% would heal by uh, three weeks of time. 
coming to the other another one that's contact lens induced peripheral ulcer where we would see a defect and infiltration and necrosis of anterior stroma that's why the name is clpu uh, the symptoms would range from patient being asymptomatic to moderate pain redness watering irritation and very few would uh, complain of white spots the signs would be a defect Uh, epithelial defect with single circular focal infiltrate which is up to 2 mm in diameter and there would be uh, diffuse cellular reaction uh, we have done corneal biopsy in some of these and we saw that there is epithelial loss and bowman's layer is intact along with stromal infiltration but there was no evidence of microorganism in these patients again rapid resolution occurs on discontinuation of lens wear results in 3 weeks time but we need to differentiate these from infectious keratitis uh, and these are the various uh, earlier it was discussed the only thing we should remember is microbial keratitis would worsen without aggressive treatment and immediate relief will be obtained with clpu and it is like self limiting disease so as you can see here this is small peripheral this is also like we would say mid periphery but as you can see that it is larger in diameter along with ac reaction more common with extended wear contact lenses coming to infiltrative keratitis it is inflammatory reaction of cornea characterized by anterior stromal infiltrates with epithelial involvement the signs are similar to clear or the only thing is here the eye is not closed uh, the symptoms occur later uh, sort of without any uh, wake up in, uh, patient being wake, uh, waking up in the morning various factors are involved like uh, foreign body trapped under contact lenses or mechanical trauma and discontinuation of lens wear again is the uh, treatment Uh, CLPC is the single most important reason for uh, lens discontinuation. Patient may present with symptoms of itching, discharge, excessive movements of contact lenses, fluctuating vision, and uh, progressive intolerance to contact lens wear. The signs would be redness of upper tarsus, papillary and stringy or ropey discharge in these patients. It can be general, it can be localized. It is due to hypersensitivity reaction and mechanical trauma from lens age or surface. and more common with high dk lenses compared to low dk lenses and uh, the location would guide us whether it is related to soft contact lenses again if it is classic sometimes there may be permanent discontinuation of contact lenses but it uh, if it is early asymptomatic reducing the wearing time and providing new lenses would help localize we can see lens uh, we can discontinue lens wear for 2 weeks monitor these patients and if symptom improves we can continue lens wear but papillary would be visible in these patients so decreasing wearing time switching to a different lens type uh, using frequent replacement lenses proper cleaning would help and along with the man medical management would help reduce this complication coming to superior epithelial acute lesion it's mechanical injury to corneal epithelium which is characterized by this arc like lesion which can be seen here the patient may be asymptomatic or may complain of a complain of foreign body sensation irritation and discomfort this is arc like grayish white lesion as i showed you earlier and here with hipped up edges and it will take up stain it is mostly seen with high modulus lenses and also depends on the lead tone of a patient seen with high dk lenses and it results after discontinuation of uh, lens wear so most of these uh, reactions are uh, significant coming to asymptomatic infiltrates these are very small focal and usually seen only on examination and this can be bilateral based on this we have done a, again a retrospective study and what we found was that in uh, 544 soft contact lens users we had 12.5% of these adverse events so we know that there are various risk factors like age amyotropia history of ocular prior ocular inflammatory events smoking and corneal staining and limbal redness and also the extended wear so these inflammatory events are because of microbial contamination of contact lenses vascularization reduced lens movement or dry eyes dry spots and working in non ideal environments so we did few more studies to know why these have, how can we prevent these and what we found that less adverse less adverse events were noted if we did a morning replacement of lens rather than doing a nightly replacement because that would reduce the adverse events rubbing and rinsing of the lenses each morning resulted in less mechanical adverse events but it increased clear and there was no benefit benefit of using eye drops on the lens after waking up in all this is in patients for who are using lenses on extended wear basis 
So to summarize, uh, the serious and symptomatic complication of microbial keratitis should be referred appropriately. And the significant symptomatic, all these, and the non-significant asymptomatic can be taken care of by uh, contact lens practitioners. And even if the patient discontinues contact lenses, probably if he's better, he may not come to us. Thank you so much. I think I finished in time. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I think you're you're right on time. So thank you. Sorry, the re uh, sorry. Um, otherwise, I think we're a, a, a little behind schedule. Um, if anyone has any sort of burning questions, um, if they want to put them in the chat box. Otherwise, I think we're going to wrap up because because um, we are a little bit behind time. Well, only one minute actually, so we're we're doing okay. Um, so I want to thank everyone for for joining us, and thank you especially um, for inviting us to be part of this wonderful wonderful meeting. Um, we're very honored that, that we were included and we look forward to more joint collaborations in the future. Um, and we um, encourage you to please visit our website. I'll make sure to share that information with Amrata um, regarding our upcoming meetings because we would love to have, have you join us either virtually or hopefully someday, someday in person. And again, we're, we do welcome um, international members to our organization. So. Um, please contact any one of us if you're interested in, in joining or, or even just learning more about it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, uh, Christina and uh, Vishal Janji for uh, moderating the session, for coordinating the session. And I would like to thank uh, Dr. Deep Thaliwal, a good friend of mine for many years now, and Dr. Benny Jeng. Thank you so much for allowing us to do our AIO session with ECLA and thank you for such a positive response. We hope to have you again and again on our virtual platform and also on our physical platform when things get better. Thank you so someday, much. Someday. Thank you. We'd love thank that. You. Thank you. Wonderful uh, session, wonderful meeting. Yeah, thank you, Namrata. Thanks everybody, it was a great thank session. Thank you, Benny, thank you. Thank you, bye. Uh, the recording of this will be available uh, uh, from uh, after tomorrow and it will be sent to the ECLA also uh, for their uh, website. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you so much for that. Bye, Devi. Uh, I would say <laughs> before it closes. It was so good to see you. You are mute. You are. You have to unmute. Varsha and I worked together at Boston Site ten years ago, probably. And she's looking younger, and I'm looking smarter. Must be the glasses. So anyway, and when I went to LV Prasad, she hosted me. So we're old friends. I was so thrilled to see your name on the program. Yeah, same and I'm Michelle too. Michelle, someone I worked with years ago. Boston site introduced me to the whole world. Same for me. Yeah. So, so you all should become, we would love you to become members of the Eye and Contact Lens Association to continue this collaboration. Sure. That would be wonderful. Okay. Sounds great. Okay. Thank you. Bye. Thanks. Be well, guys. See you. Yeah. Bye, Debbie. Bye, Varsha. Say hi to all my friends in Hyderabad. Yes. Yes. Stay well. I, I'm doing a project with some students in Cyan Basu now. Oh, that's uh, great. Okay. And imaging. Yeah. And okay. uh, someone else. I can't remember his name now. It's too early in the morning. But uh, okay. <laughs> I will. Uh, yeah, I'll talk to Cyan. Yeah, sure. Take care. Bye-bye. Yeah, bye-bye. Bye. -bye. bye.